Join me at CMC. Get engaged and get educated. Join me at CMC. Everyone is welcome. Join me at CMC. Come grow your relationships. Join, Join us at CMC. CMC. CMC is real, authentic conversation. conversation. Engage with curious people. Plus, we give you access to thought leaders. Be informed, be inspired. Through community conversation. Come here and meet your neighbors. Be here in the room. Ask questions. Get, Get answers. answers. Connecting people and ideas. Learn about Columbus. Who will you see at CMC? Join me at CMC.
You're invited. Watch us on live stream or in person. You're invited. Join the conversation. You're invited. Welcome to CNC. Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Founded in 1976 by 13 visionary women leaders, CMC's mission is to connect people and ideas through community conversation. From its beginning, CMC has welcomed everyone. I'm Doug Buchanan, the Editor-in-Chief of Columbus Business First. I'm also a proud member of the CMC Board of Trustees. Let's begin by meeting our newest CMC members. They are Judith Chess, Jean Garonsky, Daniel Vandergriff with the Ohio Network of Children's Advocacy Centers, Joyce Wallach and Maddie Wilming with Cover My Meds. Welcome to CMC. If you're not already a member, please join. It's easy to do on the CMC website and you even get an upgraded name tag with a green member sticker. So don't discount that to benefit. Uh, Please let, take a moment to look at the back of your forum flyers because there you'll see the organizations that provide the not-for-profit Columbus Metropolitan Club with half of its annual revenue. To join those sponsors, please see Jane Scott up here at the front table or Lainey Cuthbert at the back table. Lainey, give a wave. All right, good enough. For today's forum, we'd like to thank WOSU Public Media, the Columbus Council on World Affairs, the League of Women Voters of Metro, of Metro Columbus for partnering with us on today's program. Let's have a hand for today's sponsors. Today's live stream is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. The Democracy in Crisis series of monthly CMC forums is examining how democracy is being challenged here in the U.S., and at today's forum, we'll explore the international challenges to democracy. To launch this second forum in the series and to introduce today's speakers, please welcome Patrick Tyrion, President and CEO of the Columbus Council on World Affairs. Patrick, the podium is yours. Great, thank, thank you, Doug. Please continue eating if, you, if you'd like. Uh, as Doug mentioned, I'm the CEO at the Columbus Council on World Affairs, and really our whole point for existing is to help everybody, people like you and me, make sense of the world. And, you know, we're, the way we do that is trying to work with students first to help them make sense. Uh, we work with 1,200 high school students in 20 school districts, uh, amazing and inspiring young people. That's why we, we train employers around the community from nationwide to the city of Westerville on how to, inter how to interact and communicate effectively with our growing diversity and, and global connections. And it's why we published the Global Report, which is at your seats, um, as a way for people to better understand our global connections. And it's something we do proudly and we think is really important. We know there's always connections to local, which is part of what led us to the partnership with the Columbus Metropolitan Club. But the real kicker is what you know already, is that the, the CMC is an innovative, forward-thinking and high-quality partner, and we're pleased to be delivering together with them some of this content for, for the year. I just asked my team here to raise their hands if you want to learn more about the council. Raise it high. Yeah, great, great. So I'm privileged to introduce today's expert panel who will be shedding light on the important issue of extremism as it relates to democracy. Something that we see, you know, as locally as in today's dispatch and as globally as the war in uh, Ukraine. I do want to note that one of the people that was originally listed is, is home with, with illness, um, uh, Dr. Laura Dugan. So you won't have a chance to hear her from her today, although um, she sends her regards. But you will have the benefit of hearing from these panelists. All of whom are from the Ohio State University. For, to the farthest end there, Dr. Christopher Gelpi, who is the director of the Mershon Center for International Security Studies and professor of political science. Next to him is Victoria Gurevich, 
She's a graduate student in political science. And we have one more that is not, where's Dr. Payan? There he is. <laughs> the one I've known the longest. And as my team says, you miss things sometimes. <laughs> Sorry about that, Dr. Payan. I've known Dr. Payan for a long time. Um, and he's always our go-to around topics around the Middle East, particularly around Afghanistan. Dr. Payan has been the longtime director of OSU's Middle East Study Center. And our host, Mike Thompson, the Chief Content Director of News and Public Affairs for your WOSU Public Media. More details about the program is in, about, is in your flyer. And Mike, let's kick it off with some good conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is afternoon. Yes, it is afternoon. Welcome to uh, season one, episode two of our Democracy in Crisis uh, series. Uh, you can binge it later after we're all done and we've solved all the world's problems, I'm sure, on the YouTube channel. Um, in this series, we do hope to shed light on the polarization that we're all experiencing right now, find out what's behind it, what its roots are, and with the hope of trying to figure out how to solve it and how to bring us together. In our first episode, we heard from Michael Tomaski, and he reminded us that we have pretty much always been polarized. Um, and political extremism, while rare, thankfully, has also been a constant uh, in our nation's history. Um, extremism on the right, of course, has been uh, dominating recently, but the practice has a long bipartisan history those on the left were responsible for eco-terrorism. The weather underground of the 1970s bombed the Capitol and the Pentagon. Uh, in the past few years, we've seen violent Antifa protests and more recently attacks on pregnancy centers around the country. On the right, of course, we can point to 4,400 Americans who were lynched from the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s. There was the Oklahoma City bombing, attacks on abortion providers, racially motivated mass shootings in Charleston, Buffalo, and three years ago today in El Paso, Texas. Um, and of course, the attack on the Capitol on January 6th of 2021. So we'll try to understand why all of this happens, both here and abroad, and what we can do to try to stop it, uh, ideally. So let's start with some uh, definitions. Uh, Dr. Gelpi, what is an extremist? Oh boy. Um, what is an extremist? Uh, I mean, I think what is extreme actually varies based on the, um, uh, on the context of the sort of political opinions in, in a particular country. So things that are extreme in the United States would not be, view, would be viewed as extremist in the United States would not maybe be viewed, uh, uh, elsewhere as extremist elsewhere. But, um, I think in terms of thinking about the, the threat to democracy, um, I would say the, the important thing about uh, extremism is that it, uh, it, un it undercuts the sort of due, proce due process of democratic procedure. Um, and, and in particular, I think at least in terms of the, the research that Victoria and I are doing, um, we're especially interested in the use of violence uh, to uh, to subvert a democratic process. So that's the kind of extremism that uh, that that we're most concerned about here. And that I think you know, if you're if you're thinking about what's a threat to democracy, that's the kind of extremism that I would be most worried about. One man's extremist is another person's freedom fighter. That is true in many cases. Well, let me now. In Arabic word for extremist is ghulu in Arabic. In Farsi, the Persian language, it is ifrati girai. What does it mean that, uh, that it, an extremist is the one, either a person or a group or a state? Because extremism could be, could be acted by individuals, by groups and by states and by empires in many cases. So it is that the people that who commit acts that which are far and above what is accepted by the mainstream people of the same region. So if it's too far to the right, 
it is called ifrat in arabic and if it's too far from the to the left it is tafrit so both of them are considered to be so that's what the definition in the middle east the middle eastern context is that the people that who act which are far far from the normal are from the middle uh, because in all religions of the middle east whether it's the judaism christianity and islam they've all supported uh, some sort of moderation in actions and prayers and everything not to exaggerate to the level that it it, it goes to the extreme victoria who who draws that line and does that line move on what path? on where the line between extremism and aggressive protest say is what is too far who who sets that boundary that's I mean, every person or government, whoever is in charge, gets to decide, you know, where to intervene. But wherever that decision is made, there is a cascading series of repercussions that happen, right? So to um, Chris's point that what is extremism and what we're concerned about most obviously is violence, right? We say, like, violence is where we draw the line, harm to others. However, if you make that decision, it's easy to work around it, right? There's so many groups that then intentionally direct their members not to engage in violence, to stay legitimate and to stay permissible. And this then uh, throws into, uh, complicates this impression we have of the lone wolf terrorist, right? Because they acted alone, but everyone else exists in this ecosystem around them. They weren't violent. Were they not an extremist if they were like encouraging that behavior if they contributed ideologically. So any decision you make, there are consequences that, that come from it. So any decision as to how to define it, there are things that then evade your attention, important things. So to draw that line both needs to happen, but you're going to miss a lot wherever you draw that line. So it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish if you are you know, looking at this from a law enforcement perspective, you're going to have to draw the line at violence, and that's where you're looking. But if you're a civil society organization, you might want to draw the line a little bit back and find a way to include nonviolent expressions of extremism in order to reach and have your mandate reach those um, ideological activities as well, short of violence. Um, let's get to some of the roots and how, how we get to, to this point. The University of California, Davis, recently had a survey that showed that one in five adults in the United States would be willing to condone acts of political violence. 12% thought it was, quote, sometimes justified to use violence if it meant returning Donald Trump to the presidency. Dr. Gelby, how do feelings like that arise? That seems pretty stunning. Um, I think so. Yeah, those are those are pretty stunning. Um, I uh, I think it comes from a sense that the system is broken and doesn't work. Um, so uh, what and, and what I think you have with regard to sort of right wing, wing extremism in the United States today is you have a large number of people who um, believe that the uh, the democratic process has not functioned for them um, because their interests haven't been represented and they've sort of been left behind. So a lot of these folks are um, uh, e economically. So, you know, it's it's largely kind of rural white America that is uh, that is not done well, say, over the last 40 years um, and feel like the uh, the system doesn't work for them, and so that is what leads you to feel like I have to do something outside the system in order to, in order to be heard, in order to have my interests represented. Is there it's distrust in elections? You know, it started in 2000 with Bush v. Gore, then Kerry, we know in Ohio, is very close. Some Democrats, a very small number, questioned that election. Then, of course, 2016, Hillary Clinton wins by 3 million votes, and the popular vote loses the election, and then 2020 is a whole different level. Um, it's been a long time in coming, so you can see how January 6th would happen. Dr. Payan. Uh, I was asked to write something on Middle East as the arena of conflict yeah. throughout the history. So I focused more on, on the extremism and conflicts in the Middle East, not in the United States. Uh -huh. uh, in the United States, what 
my students have always asked me about this question, that why these extremist acts happen and why Middle East is the arena that where it happened more than any other place. So it depends on if the United States will be the same as it is the Middle East, uh, different religions, different ethnic groups. So there is always the possibility of differences between different groups. But the United States is not, it's much different. Here, democracy took roots. In many of the Middle Eastern countries, democracies did not take any, except for Israel that what can say that governments change without any fighting. But all others, either it's the family regimes or the dynastic regimes of Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, or it is dictatorships. So again, coming to that question of whether the democracies are a place where this extremism can thrive uh, the answer from the Middle Eastern people themselves is that that usually this extremism is thriving in areas where there is no rule of law. It's not, um, we're not talking about the democracy in the Middle East. We're talking about, talking about some sort of representative governments in the Middle East. That does not exist either. So uh, when I will come to, I will be speaking yeah. about my talk. I will, I'll discuss that matter there. Victoria, the scene we saw on January 6th was a scene we've seen in Middle Eastern countries, in developing nations. Uh, I think that's what's so stunning about the people climbing up the walls and breaking into the, the house of, uh, of the people and, the, and the, the center of government. Is that is there a difference between that extremism and the extremism we've seen in you know, places like Haiti or uh, Sri Lanka recently, where they, where they invaded the uh, government offices? Oh, man. I mean, the execution, I would focus more on the intention and the beliefs behind it that led to those moments, which is important to consider. In which case, I would say you know, yes and no, because it doesn't matter if the feelings are, feelings are real. So if the people felt um, uh, marginalized, ignored, disempowered, it doesn't matter if you could objectively point and say, you're not really, it's fine, it was real, it was legitimate compared to places where the elections are definitely not legitimate and the grievances and experiences are objectively much worse. It still feels the same, I think, to the people who uh, feel roused to action in those kinds of ways. So I think that it's a tough question, right? Because you also want to don't want to legitimize something that's not deserving of that kind of honor and saying, yes, you do feel ignored when historically in the context of this country they have been, but not. So it's a tricky question. I would say there are definitely similarities um, in how to address it. Maybe the roots of it would be a bit different if anyone has. Go ahead. I, I, would, I would say if you, th in thinking about it, I mean, I agree with what Victoria said, but I, if in thinking about it in terms of what's the process of the threats to democracy, if you think about the threats to democracy and how democracy has collapsed around in other places around the world, the kinds of patterns that have led to the collapse of democracy, a lot of other places around the world, those are the things that are happening in American politics today. So, you know, if you want to think about countries like Hungary or Brazil or lots of other countries like that, we're not that different. Um, and so I think we need to take it seriously because democracy can collapse. It does collapse in other countries and the things that make it collapse in other countries are happening here. I get this question from my former students from the Middle East, from Iran, from Afghanistan, from even Pakistan. This is the question that they ask me as someone that who have been teaching at the Ohio State University for the past 37 years that they think that I know about everything, uh, which I don't. Uh, their question is that what happened on January the 6th, how could this happen in the United States? If it would happen in Pakistan or Afghanistan or Iran, we would have said that how could this happen in a country such as the United States that an election could be stolen? If it is true, it is stolen. And if it is not stolen, how can people really stomach this? Uh, especially in a country which is the, the best educated and it has a democracy and 
from its independence. And even the French and others have written about the good democracy in the United. How could it happen in a country which is, which, which is the beacon of democracy? This kind of thing could happen. Except that this, this uh, January the 6th, they are stunned. Many of them who are graduates from American universities, I'm not talking about the ones that who went to either Al-Hazar University or any other Middle Eastern. So this is a big question for them. They are, they are really stunned. They do not know how to, how to answer this. And we from this end also have difficulty really explaining to them that why, why this happened in the United States. How much of it is the, is the media? Um, we've, we've really fragmented. We're all watching certain things. There's so many choices. So we gravitate to channels, to platforms that fit our worldview or our national view. You hear it on the testimony before the January 6th committee, some of the folks who participated in January 6th now have regrets because they felt like they were lied to. But at the time, they thought it was true. How much of that is, is behind this, this extremism? Um, I, th I think the media and the fragmentation of the media environment is a very big deal. Um, and I think, uh, I think that the rise of partisan media, you know, starting with Fox News really in 1996 and then MSNBC answering and so on, um, is, is a big deal uh, because of the kind of echo chamber effect that, you ha uh, that, that you're talking about. And there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that um, watching that sort of partisan media on either side really does actually change attitudes and, um, uh, and drive polarization. Um, I would note though, and this goes back to a point that was uh, made earlier about how this is, this is not a new process. Um, the, the shift away from broadcast media where you have the um, public, uh, public interest uh, clause for being able to use public airwaves, the shift from that to um, online, right, gets rid of the, the, the need for there to be a public interest function for news. And that is what creates the big shift uh, beginning in the mid 1990s. However, I would say this America has survived this before because our media environment right now is not that different than our media environment 100 years ago from now. If you look at newspapers uh, from the um, late 19th, early 20th centuries, super, super partisan. Um, with that said, the politics of the 1920s were pretty rough. So, um, uh, so we're probably in for a bumpy ride. I, I would also add um, not just the polarization of public media, but social media and the algorithms. Um, I teach a class on radicalization and de-radicalization and the students in my class, they get to choose a different case study. Um, and one of the case studies is on incels and voluntary celibates. And some bold girls in the class <laughs> decided to go on TikTok, make an account and just start clicking material that gradually built into a direction that they thought would become more misogynistic. And they could get there in five clicks to get to content that you think would just be at like the depths of the internet, but it was right there. And the way a lot of these algorithms are incentivized um, is to get you to click more. Uh, the New York Times has a great podcast on radicalization called Down the Rabbit, or just called The Rabbit Hole, which talks about how this guy got up to viewing YouTube for eight hours a day because the incentives of these algorithms was to get him to click and to get him to keep watching. So I definitely think, you know, the Fox News and the CNNs polarize these, but the algorithms working on the social media apps that so many of us are on also play a very uh, insidious role in all of this. Dr. Pam, what do you think is the greatest threat right now? What's the current threat? Is it political extremism? Is it religious extremism? Or is it racial extremism? Or is is there something else I'm leaving out? All of the above, I would say. Um, uh, religious extremism is not new in the Middle East. Not, when you go to the Old Testament, you will find that uh, the Egyptian pharaohs committed atrocities and extremism. Assyrians, Babylonians, and even some people think that the Arab Muslims, they, they did the whole Christians did, the Crusaders, uh, Inquisition, which happened. So this is this political and religious terrorism or extremism is nothing new. Uh, it transforms from one shape to another one. 
Um, well, I'll just share you with one thing that I, one of my students just wrote to me, text last night. Uh, he said that about Ayman al-Zawahiri, which was just killed in Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan. Taliban sheltered him. And he just said that, I asked him the question, I said, well, what are people think? He said that except the jihadi groups in Afghanistan, like Taliban and Al-Qaeda followers and Islamic Jihad and Al-Khurasan, everyone else is happy that this notorious terrorist is gone. So this does not, it's not reflected in the same fashion in American mass media. Uh, that well, that's it's certain groups are the ones that which are committing. And they are in charge of the power in the Middle East. They have the power, of course, and whether it's a Taliban or it's the royal family in Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, or the Ayatollahs in, 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 in Iran. So I would say that um, all of these are dangerous, uh, each one of them. And the important thing is that which one is taking advantage of the circumstances in any place. Uh, if it's religious violence in Afghanistan, is a very good place. Taliban have used that against the Soviet Union and against the United States. Uh, if it is in Pakistan, that's totally a different matter. It's of the, the India-Pakistani issues. Then if it's in the Middle East, it's the Arab-Israeli issues. Both of them are using religions and justifying based on religions and at the same time. So I would say that, um, that extremism and terrorism does not disappear. It, it changes its forms, its shapes. Uh, it, it, in some cases, some, some Middle Eastern people even use it it's just kind of chameleon that which can really adapt to the environment at the time and the time and using. So it, I would say that all of them are dangerous. Turning to the domestic threats, what would you, how would you rank political, religious, racial extremism in the U.S. as a, as a greater threat? I think that there, well, one, I don't know if the distinction is necessarily important rather than just looking at who's the most active both in frequency and in fatalities where it's coming from also political racial religious uh motivations are also often baked into one um if you look at you know abortion rights it's a political issue which has a lot of religious dimensions to it that distinction who picks up um who is energized by that question can come from both like political orientations and it can be a post hoc rationalization of why they became involved in it. So rather than looking at the source um, in order to determine what the priority is or what should be most concerning, I'd rather look at the size of their network, the you know frequency and violence of their activities in order to determine that prioritization. We hear about the Proud Boys, uh, the three percenters. We see the images of the militias. We saw them on January 6th. We see them being charged. Uh, how are, are we making too much of these groups? I mean, they're they're pretty intimidating, but are we are they as big a threat as perhaps some fear they are? I think we're not making enough of these groups um, in terms of how. Uh, America is responding to them, and that, and actually, that's some of the the research that, that Victoria and I have been doing is is about comparing um, responses to uh, white supremacist violence versus versus responses to um, Islamic extremist violence. And um, what we find in a variety of different kinds of experiments that we run is that, in general. Um, Americans are a lot less concerned about white supremacist violence than they are about Islamic extremist violence, despite what um, Victoria was saying before about how, uh, in terms of numbers of deaths and so on, um, white supremacist violence is clearly um, it, is clearly a bigger threat in terms of uh, killing killing people and so on. So I. I I feel like we need to be paying more attention to this. And um, if you reorienting in our minds, if you will, a, a, our image of what a terrorist, who a terrorist is and what a terrorist looks like um, that we've been focusing for 20 years on our particular image. And we just, there was, um, oh, now I'm blanking on his name, who was, who was um, killed in the drone strike. Uh, the, I was worried. The, yeah. Um, so that's what we think of as the terrorist threat to America. That's what we thought about for the last 20 years or so. But 
white supremacist violence is a bigger threat to America right now than Al Qaeda. Yeah, the um, Anti-Defamation League did a study over the past 10 years. There have been about 450 murders committed by political extremists. Right-wing extremists committed 75% of those murders, according to the ADL. Islamic extremists responsible for 20%, and left-wing extremists, 4%. So the, the, those are the statistics you mentioned there, that yeah. lately it's been uh, right-wing extremists. Uh, Dr. Payan, you, you, you've, you've closely monitored the past 20 years, being from Afghanistan, traveled there, studied it, had to explain to us, explain to them what's going on. Have we put the blame on the wrong people for the past, certainly the past 10 years? The main problem was that neither the Soviet Union, which invaded Afghanistan from 1979 to 19, 1989, they could not correct things. They did not build anything in Afghanistan except destroyed it. And then after September the 11th, Americans went there. Uh, a government was put in place which was very incapable. And everyone in Afghanistan knew about Hamid Karzai and others and others. And the same, the Ashraf Ghani government, there were very, I, I would say that these were the people that were not even, they did not know their own society. Many of them grown and raised and educated in foreign countries. So that was the main problem. The Soviet Union had the same problem. They did not have the cadres on the ground. They did not have the programs to implement in Afghanistan. So what happened after 10 years, they just left. And one year later, the Soviet Union collapsed. I do not know, one of the newsmen asked President Trump, that uh, why are we withdrawing our troops from Afghanistan? And he said that, well, there was a thing such as the Soviet Union and they went to Afghanistan and they became bankrupt and now it collapsed. So that, that's what we do not want to do that. I mean, that's, if that's the mindset of someone that in Afghanistan after 10 years, the Soviet Union failed and after 20 years, Americans failed it, there is something wrong from the beginning that they did not do well their job. They did not study Afghanistan. They did not, they did not do their homework. Uh, right now, Taliban, for example, are in control of Afghanistan. But if Taliban will go to the election tomorrow, if there is election, they will not get three or four percent of the vote in Afghanistan. It is the power of coercion and weapons and others that which are supported from either the radicals, Islamists in the Middle East or in Pakistan. Taliban will not be in control of Afghanistan if it would not have been. One of the things that Americans did not do, they did not pressure Pakistan to the level to prevent Taliban the Taliban headquarters are in Pakistan and they get weapons from there, whether the charities are religious endowments from the Arab rich countries. So the problem, the Soviet Union faced the same problems, Americans face the same, and Afghans have their own problems. And it's a country that I think that only in, in some sort of pipe dream, if someone can think, that the international community will get together and do things straight in, in Afghanistan. And that's not happening. Let's get to how we can uh, stop this. Um, in the past week, a judge has sentenced Guy Wesley Reffitt for his role in the January 6th insurrection. He got seven years in prison. Can we police our way, arrest our way, imprison our way out of extremism, away from this threat? No. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, no, I mean, I think that's definitely a component of it, but U.S. law enforcement um, is hampered by the different ways to designate um, foreign and domestic terrorism. So there is no domestic terrorism federal law. And that means that you can't intervene left of boom. You need something to have, boom being the moment of the violence, um, whereas with foreign terrorism, you can charge people with materially supporting. There are all these other, and I'm not a law student, but as I understand, there are all these other um, avenues for intervention, whereas for domestic extremism and domestic terrorism, you don't have that recourse. So you really have to wait for something to happen. But then this circles back to what is extremism. Law enforcement can then only intervene with the violent offenders. There are plenty of groups, both currently and historically, that direct their members not to engage in violence, don't do anything. We need to present a non-violent, legitimate position for people to see us as viable. Uh, so policing is definitely a component of it, which has 
actually its own uh, problems involving the FBI and sting operations, um, trying to police your way out of it, usually involves setting people up to do something uh, which is then coercive and they don't get convicted anyway. These were the Gretchen Whitmer kidnappers. Uh, they, the case was dismissed because they proved that the F were proved. They uh, convincingly demonstrated that the FBI agent who was like handling these people led them to the actions that they themselves would not even take. So in that case, law enforcement didn't work, right? They tried to intervene with a group of people that were plausibly going to engage in violence, but then the courts said no. Um, so no, we can't arrest our way out of this. Christopher, I think we, we all watched January 6th, and in the days right after January 6th, there was outrage, universal outrage. And I think many of us thought, okay, this is it. This is the tipping point. We've gone too far. Now we're going to pull it back. We're going to become more reasonable. I think that lasted for about a month. Um, it was hard for politicians on the right to condemn these folks just straight out. Why is that? Um, because, well, I mean, the, the two word answer is Donald Trump. Um, but, uh, but I, but I, and, uh, but the larger answer, I think really, um, uh, fits into the second reason why I, I agree with everything Victoria said about how we can't, we, there need to be legal changes in order to be able to police this. But in addition to that, we would have to disentangle, uh, the sort of right, right wing extremist violence movements from the political process, that there is a political constituency in America that is um, sympathetic to uh, those that kind of violence. And, and we have the leadership of a, one of the major political parties that is, um, th that is condoning that association. And as long as um, Donald Trump is able to uh, is able to make it Im politically impossible for um, Republicans to stand up against white supremacist violence, um, then then it's going to be very hard to very hard to police it because you have a, a major political party that is that is at least tacitly uh, supporting that violence. Looking to another possible solution. In the past week, you've mentioned it earlier that uh, Al Qaeda leader Ayman al Zawahiri was was killed by the CIA. Can we kill our way away from extremism? I don't think so. But my own view is that it could not have happened without the intelligence on the ground. Either the Taliban or anyone else, this kind of precision could not happen if there is no intelligence on the ground. Does that now, violence inflame extremists even more? Is there a danger in it going is, that route? It is inflaming the extremists, but it is really pleasing the ones that were not extreme. Mm -hmm. And that's the majority in most of these countries are the people that who just want to have food for their children in schools and they don't, they're not extremists. Mm -hmm. that, that's what in, in the past 37 years I've been doing this field research in different Middle Eastern countries. People are not happy with the extremists. At the same time, they are not happy with their corrupt governments. Mm -hmm. Hosni Mubarak for 30 years being the president till he was removed. Every one of them, uh, uh, the Tunisian president. And if Sadat would be alive, he will still be the president of Egypt, for example. So how so do the moderates get, because it's the same as in this country. The extremists are, are very, very small. More now on the right, but there are some on the left. But most people are in the middle. How do we, how do we as a culture elevate those voices? Can we elevate those voices? Are there any lessons from around the world that could, could help us here? I think that we, we are blaming this right-wing extremists. Mm -hmm. It's not only the right-wing extremists like the proud, proud boys and this and that. There are other people too. Look at the, the Congress and how many people are supporting this that, that the election was stolen. It's a very large number of mm -hmm. congressmen and senators. It's Josh Weil, not only one, or Ted Cruz or other. There are hundreds. So whether we should tell them that they are influenced by the right-wing extremists. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not only that the, the fear should not be only from the right wing extremists. It's the fear is somewhere else too that we do not look at that um, from a very close perspective. Thoughts on the voice of the middle, a more reasoned approach. Even if you have fierce disagreements, let's look at issues like guns and the abortion issue. Very clear lines, but 
there's no seem to be no middle ground in solving those issues. Um, I would say one thing that we ought to do is actually um, be willing to take a hard look at ourselves and our own um, attitudes that I think the kinds of um, attitudes that give space for um, racially motivated or, or right-wing extremist violence in, in America are attitudes that um, a lot of us may hold in some sort of unconscious way. Um, and, and if we if we are willing to look at ourselves and t take a hard look at biases that we may have, um, we can start to diffuse some of the sort of wider support for um, for ex extremist violence. So. Um, for example, in one of the experiments that um, uh, the Victoria and I did, um, we asked people about sentencing. Um, we gave them an example of an extremist and we randomly varied different aspects of the crime. And um, what, we what we found was that, um, uh, that white extremists were not punished more if they actually carried out their terrorist activity and killed people whereas somebody who's labeled as a non-citizen or somebody who's labeled as Muslim was, was punished, was about twice as likely to get the death penalty, for example, as a, as a recommendation. So, and these are, these are, this is something that existed. This is not just in the Republican Party. This was um, across a large sample. And actually, uh, you might think that youth would get us out of this, but unfortunately, we replicated the study among Ohio State students. And I'm sorry to say that Ohio State students did the exact same thing. So um, there's, there's a much wider spread sort of um, set of racial um, uh, biases or assumptions that we have, racial and, and also national. This is about immig immigration as well. Um, so, you know, start, start by examining yourself. <laughs> to, to punctuate the, those findings, because I think these were really interesting. And so how it was... Um, a bomb plot that we like they read a hypothetical scenario and we varied you know a name that was meant to convey like a white identity and a name that was meant to convey a muslim identity and then what we varied was if the plot was successful um that you know they killed 12 people in this bomb plot or if it failed and so the failure was a you know technical glitch. It had nothing to do with intent and we found then we said you know what should the sentence for this person be death penalty, life in prison, 25 years. And for white citizen offenders, we found that from a plot or from a success, from a failed detonation to a successful attack, the probability of the death penalty did not change. Meaning, you know, like 20% said, yeah, you'll still get the death penalty. But even if you were successful and you killed 12 people, that didn't change anything. Whereas for Muslim citizens, we found that at the beginning, when it was just a failed plot, the probability of the death penalty was the same at 20%. But for Muslim citizens, if they were successful, the death penalty shot up to like 50% or something, which suggests there was like this punitiveness um, related to your question. But I just wanted to punctuate that like part of our findings that I thought was important to highlight. We want to get to questions. It is CMC's tradition to take questions from our audience. If you're watching us online, please write your question into the chat function. Uh, and if you are here at the Boathouse, please uh, approach the microphone. Jane Scott has our first online question. Well, we have quite a few questions. So anyone in the room, please join me and we'll do every other one. Kathy Fox asks, author of our own worst enemy, Tom Nichols, attributes recent extremism, especially on the right, to boredom and a desire to, quote, be seen as somebody. What are the panelists' thought on this premise? Is extremism rooted in boredom and the desire for notoriety? I think that's much more than these. Um, let's see. I'll just use one of the questions that I'm asked by, by my former students from Afghanistan that who were educated here and went back to Afghanistan. That why when the United, when, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979 and the same sort of help was not available for the Afghans. And when the Soviet Union, the Russia invaded Ukraine last year, and why this kind of help? 
billions of dollars in military equipment and this and that. Why this happened? Why? I could not answer really rightly. Probably what came to my mind was that probably they're white, they're Christians, they're Europeans. And who cared about the Afghans? They did not have petroleum, just like the Saudi Arabia does. And Saudi Arabia has petroleum. Our presidents go there and come back and then shake their hands. <laughs> so that because the petroleum. And Afghanistan does not have that. So the, the, I give these examples. And I do not know whether I really, I would like the audience that were my questions valid that I, I mean, answered that because the difference between Afghanistan and Ukraine was, was Europeans, whites, and Christians. And Afghans were Muslims, backward, did not have oil. Uh, and, and so that's, and not whites. So I, I, I do not know. This is a question that we have to all answer. Uh, and I do not know. I ask your help. Oh, what you, what, other people on the panel, what do you think about that notion uh, that it's I, idle so minds? I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of that view uh, because I think it sort of dismisses a lot of the the deeper processes that are going on. It's just like we're bored and I want to be seen. I, I mean, I think there are real issues and reasons for people to be upset um, and to feel like they might need an extreme solution. So for example, um, life expectancy for um, whites who don't have a college education is actually going down in America, right? That's crazy. Um, and so there's, there's a reason for these people to believe that they're being left behind. Um, and I think it's anger that comes out of that sort of thing that is, uh, that is generating this violence. And then the question is, okay, so something has gone radically wrong in terms of how um, a, a large chunk of Americans are having are not having their needs met. Um, and then the question becomes, well, what is the story that we tell them about why that's happening? And the story that they have been told by and large is that it's non-white people and immigrants who are the reason why you are having this um, uh, having this problem. And that, I think, is the root of why we're seeing this, this sort of response, not just that they're bored. And oh, I would add that um, to kind of up the question. Uh, it's not boredom, but it's uh, the quest for significance is kind of a validated theory that's been thrown around. And significance is a broad term. It can be significance. It could be the pursuit of love, adventure. So boredom uh, kind of tames those feelings, but it is this more commonplace experience of wanting significance in some way. Um, so I would say not boredom, but a quest for significance definitely plays a role. Go ahead. I'm a retired social worker. Um, I have two pretty broad questions. One is about money. The other is about education. To what extent do you think money, for instance, that backing Fox News and, and a lot of the think tanks affect the, per, the public opinion in America with respect to the, the extremes and also education. To what extent are, is there a lacking of education of the younger people to learn how to be objective and, and be able to tell fa uh, reality from falsehood? Thanks. Dr. Delphi? That kind of goes to what you were saying, that disenfranchise these folks. Yeah, I think, um, so uh, I, I certainly think um, a, a, a lack, well, so there is, um, so how education can, can solve it is, is complicated, right? Because there, there is this huge gap between say, um, college educated and non-college educated, um, people in America in terms of their attitudes and all sorts of things. Um, uh, with that said, I, I'm not sure that it makes sense to say that like, well, just everybody needs to go, go to college then. Like, I'm not sure that that's, um, uh, I, I'm not sure that that's an, uh, that's an answer. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, while I mean, as an educator, I have to say that education is wonderful. But um, uh, but the fact that we found some of these kinds of biases that are that are um, that, that Victoria was talking about when we did this at Ohio State, and I love my students, and I think they're very bright. But you know that doesn't mean that these sorts of, of biases don't exist. So I, I guess I'm. I'm not sure that just saying let's educate people more is going is going to do it. Another question from the audience. Um, this is uh, there's a similar question, so I'm going to combine them. Isaac Bean, if violence 
political extremism is inherently negative, how do we square the Revolutionary War and the creation of our country through that avenue? How do we determine when it's acceptable? And Rich Needles has a similar question. What are examples when extremism has been good for society? For example, where ab ab um, the anti-slavery people, abolitionists, good for society in the 19th century? I Who wants that one? Go ahead, Victoria. Sure. I think um, in that case, we just, it's important not to just look at the word extremism or the word that it was radical, uh, but rather the means that those activities were directed towards. And it's about rather introducing and securing more rights versus taking them away. And I think that's the greatest difference between the radical and extremist trends we've seen in history is that usually if you look at the suffragettes, if you look at the Revolutionary War, um, putting aside um, you know, the meat tactics of if it was violent or not, that's not necessarily important, but rather what their aims were. And it was usually the expansion of rights or grant securing more freedoms. Whereas now the trends we're seeing with far right extremism, it's about taking liberties and rights away from people. And that is the most important, I think, distinction between, you know, the use of the word extremism throughout history. Yes, um, an Egyptian sociologist by the name of Sadiddin Ibrahim, he was educated in the United States and went and he was a very prominent person. And he criticized Hosni Mubarak when he was the president of Egypt. So he was imprisoned. And most of us wrote letters about him. And so all sorts of that was a violation of freedom of expression and this and that. So finally, this guy was released. According to him, that what motivates these extremists in many countries, and he especially focused on the Middle East, that in the absence of free press, in the absence of representative government, uh, in the absence of distribution of wealth, and it's like the corruption, which really, and then the longevity of each one of these presidents and dictators from Saddam Hussein to, so he, he said, what is the other alternative left for people? It's only they're gathering in mosques, in homes, and that's what were the radical, I mean, this Ayman al-Zawahiri, he was born in a very wealthy family of doctors and lawyers, and he was trained as a, as a surgeon, and he was radicalized by this, especially, he's an Egyptian, an upper class age. And this radicalization happened to him because of these kind. In Egypt, close to Cairo, I do not know if you have been there. There are people who are born in the garbage dump. They are born there, close to that, and they are raised there. They become old and they die there. So that sort of thing. And the presidents for 30 years, 40 years, each one of them. So the, he, he gave all these examples. It's, it's, it's a Saadudin Ibrahim. I'm not a social, I'm a, I'm a social scientist, but not a sociologist. So he he thinks that the roots of this kind of extremism is it's not that they're bored, they do not. So it, it, it's really, it's a life and death question for many of them. And they cannot do anything by, by legal ways, by elections, uh, by parties, by writing. So what they do, the only thing is available is just, mm -hmm. just to kill and assassinate someone that you, you hate. We have time for one more question. Uh, go ahead, sir. Professor Gelpi, you mentioned earlier that there are democracies around the world that have fallen and that we have some of those similar characteristics or we have some of those similar situations going on. Could you enumerate and specify uh, in the democracies that have collapsed or are collapsing where we share similarities? Well, probably the number one that I would say is Hungary. So if you look at the, uh, the Viktor Orban uh, regime in Hungary and the way in which uh, he has um, used the media um, and marginalized other um, uh, marginalized other political parties and so on. Um, I, I think the Vic, Victor Orban is, is is very very much like Donald Trump, and the types of strategies that he uses um, to mobilize people is very similar. Um, I think um, uh, Erdogan in Turkey um, would be another, uh, another example of similar types of use of, um, uh, basically cl false claims about, um, election fraud, false claims about subversion, so, uh, using the government to try to suppress, uh, opinion. So, so Turkey would be another, uh, another example. Um, 
uh, I, th I think Brazil is on the way with Bolsonaro uh, in, in office. I don't know. Do y'all have other ideas of countries that are collapsing? Got it. <laughs> <laughs> those, would be, those would be my big, my, 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 my top three. <laughs> Victoria, real, real quick as we wrap up here, um, you're the youngest person up here. Are you optimistic we can overcome this and overcome this extremism? I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. I think it takes, um, I don't think it'll get better right away, but I don't think that it's only downhill. I think we're going to have, it'll get worse for a little bit, but I ultimately think that we've come a long way um, in our ability to have disagreeable political discourse. Um, what we know about these, um, I just taught a class on counter radicalization. So I think we've got at least 60 students who are ready to start working on this. Um, um, anyone else wants to take the class? Um, so yeah, I think that it's not going to get better right away, but I also don't think that this is kind of like, what is the death knell of democracy? Dr. Payan, you mentioned the roots of uh, extremism, lack of a free press. We have that, we have a democratically elected government, but we, we do have, the audience, I mean, the uh, income gap, is that, are you optimistic given that? Tremendous income gap, yeah. And, and, the, and the way that the, the, the rich and the, the elite of the society, where these elites are military elite or the civil servants, or that's the corruption is probably one, one of the problems that they all point to is the corrupt governments in many of these countries. These corrupt governments continue to perpetuate themselves it's that what I, I mentioned the longevity of each one of these, unless there is an outside force or internal revolutions or uprisings to change the government. This Arab Spring, yeah. which started in the December of 2010, and about 11, 12 countries were affected by that, from Tunisia to Yemen and Husna Mubarak was removed. This was all sick and tired of this kind of corrupt and... and, and so are you optimistic yourself? Huh? Are you optimistic for this country? I, I I'm not. I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that the, the way I saw the six, uh, January the, the sixth, in the way the election is going on, uh, it, 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 it it gives me concerns. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to get a positive here, Dr. Kelpie. <laughs> okay, I um, I'll, I'll offer hopeful, uh, which is different than optimistic. Um, I think that there are. Uh, well, and actually, I, I am optimistic that we can survive this in the sense that we have survived this and worse before, um, but uh, as a country, but that doesn't mean that it's, it's, it, that it's going to be good. And, and I do think that, you know, as, uh, as Victoria said, we have, there, there has been, there are things about our country that are better than they were 200 years ago. And so, um, you know, there's there's still an opportunity for progress, but um, I think the problems that we're facing, that the roots of this kind of violent extremism run pretty deep in America. And so uh, we shouldn't imagine that it's just gonna go away. Okay. Doug, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> okay, well, I hope you found today's forum more encouraging uh, than our panelists. Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank today's partners, WOSU Public Media, the Columbus Council on World Affairs, and the League of Women Voters of Metro Columbus. Also, thank you to our online virtual seat patrons and the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. Our special appreciation for today's speakers, Christopher Gelpi, Victoria Gurevich, and Alan Payand, and our host, Mike Thompson. Please give them all a hand. Please join us next Wednesday for Columbus Landmarks, Reborn and Repurposed, featuring the new CEO of Columbus Landmarks, Rebecca Kemper, plus a panel of experts. Thank you all for joining us. We couldn't do this without you. We look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.